So our next topic is going to be retirement strategies. I'm at that point where I feel like I want to retire, but I can't because of student loans. So it ties in really nicely with the two topics of the panels that we have coming up. So we have Kathy McCall from the AARP, who's going to be our moderator for this panel, and she will introduce the other speakers on today's panel. Great, thank you. Um, again, my name is Kathy McCall. And I am the advocacy director for AARP here in Washington State. We have about 960,000 members in the state, and I know they are also very much big library users, as well as me and my whole family. So I wanted to start out with a little bit of humor. Um, this captures a lot of what people think about when it comes to retirement planning. <laughs> Um, is it's basically you know a prayer and a wink and a nod of do I have enough money um, but I just thought this was a, a cute little um, a cartoon and if you can't read it um, from where you're sitting it says if we take a late retirement and an early death we'll just squeak by so hopefully not everybody's looking at retirement savings from that vantage point um, back in September, AARP did some research looking into um, the households here in Washington State and how ready are they for retirement. And what we found, and not really surprisingly, is that 52% of households are at risk of not having enough to maintain their living standards in retirement. Um, so this was actually the research from the uh, Retirement Research Center. Um, but we also corroborated that with some data that we did um, here in the state. So another concept that we'll talk about a little bit um, more, and I'm pleased to be on the panel, um, both with Kurt Larson with the Social Security um, Administration and Janie Ellis Elliott um, with the Washington Sheba program, um, is basically when we talk about the wobbly stool, we talk about a mix of retirement savings, Social Security, and pension that people look to to retire. And without one of those components, um, that's, that stool tips over and people are not ready for retirement. So is Washington State ready or not um, when it comes to retirement readiness? And this was a uh, poll that we did looking at um, the good news and the bad news re related to retirement savings. Um, the key aspect of this slide was that more than half, 55% of respondents, are very or somewhat anxious about their financial security <coughs> during retire retirement, but they're confident um, that they will have enough money to retire, which was very interesting for us. So it's a challenge because they they don't have the finances, but yet they feel confident. So it's a, a little false sense of security, um, which is very very concerning for us. And that holds true not only for the demographic, uh, the 40 to 50 or 50 to 60. It was also the younger generation um, felt very confident. We, when we pulled, excuse me, I think Lynn and I are sharing the same kind of um, bronchitis. Um, so that'll I'll go into that a little bit more detail. So um, one of the best ways to build um, um, income for your nest egg for retirement years is to save for retirement while working. Unfortunately, nearly a quarter, 24% of Washington adults do not have a way to save for retirement at work. When we started looking at, and I'm going to be talking about a solution that we just enacted through legislation um, about two years ago, and it's going to be launching in 2017, uh, we know that a significant portion of people, if they are able to save in the workplace, that they are 15 times more likely um, to be ready for retirement. And they're more likely to save money if they have the opportunity. So uh, this is interesting because um, for those of you who own a small or have no small business owners or you have a family member or such, a lot of people um, feel like they're going to be able to go out there, start their own small business and get ready to save for retirement. What really troubles me about this slide, um, and this is real actual responses from people uh, about how they plan to save for retirement, the one at the bottom is that they're going to win the lottery. So. <laughs> that they would rather bank in you know, buying a scratch ticket than actually putting that money into a Roth or even into a savings account for a rainy day fund. Uh, and going back to this one other slide, um, the, the real concern with this data was those last two pieces that, um, that basically 
you have 37 percent um, have no way to save or don't know if they have a way to save at their workplace. So this really creates a real crisis when it comes to retirement savings. And again, um, Washington State is you know not the only state that's struggling with this issue. It's a it's a nationwide issue. So one of the things I um, I want to just the key message, if anything, I want you all to remember, and as you interact with your patrons at the libraries is to, I think retirement savings needs to be part of the conversation. Um, anytime anybody's talking about their finances or anything, is to think about retirement savings. And we know, again, that they're going to be more likely to save for retirement. So ARP nationally is working on an initiative um, for state-based um, retirement savings programs. Washington State is going to be the first state to roll out a marketplace model um, in 2017, in, in September 2017. Oregon actually beat us to the punch by about a month. Um, so they are rolling out a slightly different model. Theirs is um, a mandated model. So everybody in the state is basically re required to save for retirement um, through their paycheck and through their um, a payroll deduction. Here in Washington State, it's going to be voluntary, but what we're hoping to do is make it incredibly easy. We've been working with nego and negotiating with financial services uh, firms in this state. Um, we have the Myra uh, program also developing a customized program for us. And so we will have a new website um, that basically is going to help um, a broader range of individuals and small businesses save for retirement. And what's interesting about this is that if we can help people save for retirement, that the state can save uh, about $300 million. Um, and that's for not paying into, uh, not having to support as big of a, a pool of money in terms of public assistance programs. And that's the SNAP program, um, the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families. There's a variety of um, both federal and state programs that if individuals can just save a modicum of a little bit more of retirement savings, they're gonna be in a much better place, and so is the state and the local economy. So the Small Business Retirement Marketplace um, is portable. It's available for all small businesses. Um, it's also available for in, um, individuals, so what we're working on is thinking about the people in the gig economy, the people that drive for Uber part of the day, they might also have a part-time job, um, but that they also have an ability to save and that savings is portable and it stays with them as the employee. So again, like I mentioned, it's launching in September 2017 um, and we're going to be working with the Department of Commerce on a pretty robust um, outreach campaign um, to bring awareness and attention to the new small business retirement marketplace. So this is a picture of the portal and what it looks like. Um, we just we're beta testing it two weeks ago, and it works really well. Um, again, it's offered to both personal for personal plans and for private plans. People can save anywhere from five dollars to five hundred. The products that are offered in there go up to a maximum of fifteen thousand dollars right now. But again, it's just for that first time saver, somebody that has never built the the muscle in terms of saving for retirement. So I'd like to, um, again, just emphasize it's launching 2017. Um, AARP and the Department of Commerce would love to work with the libraries in helping educate people about retirement savings and working with other partners in kind of helping explain and understand um, what this service is and what it means for our state. And again, um, we've been also working really closely with Senator Murray. Um, Senator Murray loves this model so much. She wants to work on a piece of national legislation to actually replicate it in other states. So we're really excited um, about being kind of the test bed for this and have been working really closely with the financial services industry that likes this model a lot. Um, so we're looking at some new creative products, hopefully, that can be offered. And again, with the goal of helping people save for retirement. And I just wanted to close again, started with a little humor. <laughs> retirement savings can be a little dry. Um, but I love this um, cartoon from Dilbert. Um, and he basically says, I saw an article that says people, most people don't have any kind of retirement plan. And he says, I plan to live an unhealthy lifestyle and pass away in my cubicle, preferably on a Monday. 
Um, and he, Dilbert says, that's terrible. And he says, that's better than average, according to you. <laughs> so in this state, we do not want to be average. We want to make sure that our millennials um, are ready to save when they hit retirement age or AARP membership age. It's too late. Um, and we really want to help engage people in the conversation and the importance of retirement savings. So next, I'm going to have... Um, Jamie or Kurt, I don't know who would like to go first. Okay, sure. Thank you. Can you guys hear me okay? Mm -hmm. um, anyway, I'm Janie Elliott. I'm a volunteer with SHIBA, which stands for Statewide Health Insurance Benefits Advisors. Um, we are a mostly volunteer program that operates out of the Washington State Office of the Insurance Commissioner. Um, and our job is to provide free, unbiased, and confidential information about health care coverage and access. Um, SHIBA was actually founded in Skagit County in 1979 and then spread around the state. And it's been so, so successful that Medicare now requires every state and territory to have a similar program. Um, every place else except here in Oregon, it's, the program is called SHIP, which is Statewide Health Insurance Assistance Program. But Apparently, we like to be a little different up in the upper left-hand corner. Um, anyway, we, um, the OIC has a small paid staff that manages the program. And then they contract with 20 sponsoring agencies across the state. Um, most of those agencies serve more than one county. Um, the larger counties, such as King County, just have one. And here, our contracting agency is um, Sound Generations, which used to be known as Senior Services. Um, and originally, we provided information on all kinds of health insurance, but since the establishment of the Affordable Care Act, um, we've left the individual health insurance market to the exchanges. And we pretty much ha handle Medicare and then people who sort of fall through the cracks or around the fringes. Um, um, Anyway, we serve people of all ages and backgrounds, um, and we especially target um, seniors and pre-retirees, um, people with low incomes, non-English speaking people, people with disabilities, and people who are uninsured or living in rural areas. Um, so the SHIBA program, SHIP program, is funded through the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. In Washington, we're lucky because we also get some state funding through the Office of the Insurance Commissioner, and that makes us a little more certain and steady on our feet than in some other areas. Um, federal funding is based on performance measures, and so we have to report the number of people we serve and how many hours we spend working with them, um, how many, uh, the number of low-income and disabled people that we serve, and uh, our total counseling hours. Um, our, our volunteers are trained for one to two days of um, small group basic training in most cases. And then they move on to shadowing an experienced volunteer and then doing some um, calls on their own with a volunteer, um, sort of monitoring them. And um, then we have ongoing monthly training meetings on topics of interest such as disability or um, Medicaid or programs that give extra help to People. Um, and these days, volunteers are also required to pass a certification test before they can start working with clients. Um, I'm happy to say that I was grandfathered, so <coughs> but it's open for. So anyway, I guess the sort of the bread and butter of what we do is individual counseling, and we do that both by phone and um, in person. We have over 30 counseling sites in King County. Most of them are senior centers and community centers, but we have at least one library, and I'm feeling lucky to get to volunteer up at uh, Shoreline Library a couple days a month, which is a great place, by the way. It's really impressive. Um, we do a lot of community outreach, and we especially do that during Medicare open enrollment and um, for people who are approaching Medicare um, eligibility. We speak at retirement fairs for larger employers. We offer quarterly classes at all three Seattle community colleges. Um, and Sheba statewide um, has been doing some happy birthday events for people who are about to turn 65, except we have about 30,000 people a year turning 65 in King County, and it would take more than our entire budget to reach out to them. So we try to do some other things. 
Um, we speak to 1-800-MEDICARE on our client's behalf, and we have a hotline that allows us to do that with virtually no hold time, which is pretty nice. Um, basically, we provide information on um, available and the most affordable coverage that people um, qualify for. Um, we run the Medicare plan finder for, to help people figure out their most affordable options. Um, and especially those that are accepted by the provider they see um, at first. And then we do that both for Part D prescription drug coverage and for Medicare Advantage plans. Um, a big part of our work is assisting low-income people in applying for extra help through Social Security. And it seems like we are seeing more and more folks who do qualify for that. Um, and we also help people apply for um, Medicare savings programs, which operate out of DSHS and at minimum pay people's Medicare Part B premium and depending on their level of income and assets, um, also pay some medical expenses. Um, we staff tables at resource fairs often and uh, we help <coughs> We assist people in understanding um, medical billing issues, although we can't necessarily resolve those. However, I found that when I call an insurance company or a doctor's office and introduce myself as being from the office of the insurance commissioner, I get a whole level of attention that an individual <laughs> doesn't. And I'm really proud to say that I've never had to refer an issue on for a complaint. But we do have a full-time person in tub water who does nothing but resolve complaints with Medicare and insurance uh, issues. Um, and we refer people to other agencies and programs. Um, although our mission is, has mostly has to do with medical insurance, a lot of the people we serve have really complicated lives and they, those issues don't sort themselves out neatly. One of the things that I'm really thrilled about um, operating out of Sound Generations is that one of their other programs that they offer is Pathways Information and Assistance, which used to be called Senior Information and Assistance. <laughs> Um, but senior isn't so sexy anymore. So <laughs> new names. Um, anyway, as far as I can tell, those people know everything, and they're just a really valuable research. Um, and uh, and we also do some collection and reporting of possible fraud issues. And actually, it's more often waste or abuse or on inaccurate billings. Um, we do find some consumer scams. A couple of years ago, somebody was calling seniors and saying they were Medicare and that the person needed to get a new Medicare card, which Medicare will never ask you to do. Um, and all you had to do was give them your Medicare number, which right now is your Social Security number, um, and your bank account number. Okay, thanks. Um, anyway, I, that hasn't been around for a while. Um, what we don't do is um, recommend specific insurance plans, agents, or brokers, um, and um, we don't act as caseworkers, although sometimes that you know, that's what we have. Um, So I've left each of you a packet um, with some information about Shiva phone numbers, um, and um, maybe most importantly, there's a contact. There's a, a memo in there from our program manager who would be happy to um, provide more materials if you want them. There's also a copy of the form that we use when people want to schedule a public outreach session. So if you'd ever be interested in posting something at your library, something in, we would be happy to um, And then on the table over there, um, yeah, and if anybody doesn't have one of those, you can raise your hand. I think I put them all the way down. Um, there's also some tear-off pads, and if you could take one and put it in a place where your patrons could see them and tear pages off of our phone number, that would be great. But Kathy was saying that she sends us a lot of referrals, and um, we're always happy to get new people calling us, because a lot of people don't know. <coughs> so, yeah. Just a quick question, J.D. When you are um, counseling people, how much privacy do you need? Well, um, over the phone, um, we, you know, usually it's just, I work from home when I'm not at the library, yeah. so I'm at home and they're, they're home. Um, for the in-person sessions, um, typically we like to have a closed office, okay. 
but at least some place that's sort of out of the flow of traffic. Okay. Thank you. And if anybody thinks they might be interested in setting up in-person counseling at their library, definitely call Arlene, our program manager. If she can find a volunteer to do it, she'd probably be happy to. I've got a question that's um, been puzzling me for quite a while. We have an individual who uses our meeting room space, but what I'm confused about is I think they're providing information like what you do. Is there a for-profit entity that's doing that work too? Yeah, they're called insurance companies. Yeah, they yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, And that's, I guess, one of the things that we really like to, we're really proud of, is that you know we don't get anything for right. like recommending programs. And we always give people multiple options. Right. But insurance brokers get commissions for signing people up. Right, and so, they, so in order to use our meeting room, it has to be right. not for profit. You know, Apple Health has been out a lot, too, oh, doing, that's, doing their... That's a good uh, thing. But this isn't Apple Health, but yeah. it, is, it is... So I'm kind of wondering if he isn't doing a for-profit version of what you're doing. There, there is a company called Levanta um, that is contracted by CMS, the, CMS? Centers, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services. They are a profit organization, but they are hired by the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare to actual troublesho troubleshoot okay. um, some of the, the problems. So, and Sheba's aware of it, and it's just kind of duplicative, um, but we, we stumbled across them too, because I was concerned um, if they were a profit-making business, but they are solely problem solving, they don't get paid by the person that oh, they're, they're working with, they're getting paid by the government. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's helpful. And they're called Livanta, L-I-V-A-N-T-A. Thank you. I didn't know about this I didn't know about your organization at all. Well, if you have a chance, you know, we can maybe put this guy out of business by having you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I love it. So that's all I've got. Everybody hear me? Is this on right now? Yep. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Kirk Larson, and I, I do work for the Social Security Administration. And uh, today I'm going to teach you a little bit about Social Security. Uh, and you all look like a reasonably intelligent group, I think. So let me, let me, and you're all clients of Social Security. You all pay into Social Security? Show of hands? All right. Oh, very good, very good. Uh, you're just about like 96% of the population, so almost everybody pays into Social Security. So almost anybody you run into needs to have information about Social Security programs. Now I'll ask you one more test. How many of you have actually opened up your individual My Social Security account so you know what your benefits are going to be? Show of hands. Want to raise those hands high? Uh, probably less than 50%. Okay. And this is a reasonably intelligent group. So. Uh, you need to know that. Very important. If you want to know what your retirement benefits are going to be, if you want to know what you would get if you became disabled, uh, if you want to know what your survivors could get if something happened to you, what your spouse could get, what your minor children could get, you need to go to the Social Security website and open up your My Social Security account. So when you have people come into the library, they, they, they're talking to you about Social Security, the first place they want to start is right here at our website. And from here, you'll see down here in the uh, lower left-hand corner, the My Social Security account. From there, you can go online and you can now open up an account. And opening that up, you can see what your future benefits are going to be. You can review your entire work history year by year to make sure that you got credit for all the work you did. Um, also, by opening that account, uh, you can get a replacement Social Security card. If you ever need to get a replacement Social Security card in the future and you have that account, you don't have to go into an office. You don't have to call us. You can just uh, request right online to get a replacement card. If you need to get a replacement Medicare card, you don't have to go into an office. You don't have to call us. You can just go to your online account, request a replacement card. If you need to get a benefit verification letter, if you need to change your, and you're getting benefits, uh, you want to change your address, change your phone number, change your direct deposit, you can do all that right online. You don't have to go into an office. You don't have to call us. Question. Can you get a Social Security card replacement card for a dependent? In order to open up a, a, uh, an account, you have to be at least age 18. And you can't open an up account for somebody else. 
So in that situation, if you're trying to get one for a 16-year-old, lost their car, doesn't know where it is, they're actually going to have to come into the office. Also, if you're changing your car, you're changing your name on it, once again, you're still going to have to come into our office. Uh, this is only to get a replacement card itself, uh, and it has to be for you as the individual. Question? I've had several people come into the library and they needed this benefit letter. Benefit verification letter, yes. Benefit verification, a lot actually, and then they would go to the website and so if they, can they get the letter <coughs> by going into my social security or do they get like they requested? So what you do is you open up the My Social Security account. Now then, okay. I won't kid you. Uh, we do like to protect your personal information, so this process is not easy. Uh, when you go online, the first thing it's going to do is ask you basic information, name, date of birth, social security number. Number two, it's then going to ask a series of uh, uh, security questions to verify who you are. The first question when I opened up my account, the first question it asked is, how many bedrooms do you have in your house? three, four, five, or none of the above. It was accessing county tax records using my social security number, identifying my land parcel, and then identifying how many rooms I had, in my bedrooms I had in my house. Computers know a lot about us, but here we're using it for good instead of evil uh, to go ahead and protect you, uh, to be sure that whoever's getting access to the information is correct. But they also access your credit history, so they'll ask you questions. You got a bank loan within the last uh, 10 years. Was it with this bank, this bank, this bank, or none of the above? So it's going to ask you a series of those questions before you then get access to that information. After you get access, you then get a pen and password, and then anytime you want to go back into it, you're going to have to set up a third level of security where you can either have a, a six-digit code text it to you or email to you, which then you're going to have to put in each time before you get access to this. We, we are very cautious about this. We want to be sure whoever's getting in is the correct person. Once you do that, there's a button there that says you need a benefit verification letter. You hit that button, prints out the letter for you. So you don't order it, it'll actually print it out for you. Now then, replacement Medicare card, replacement Social Security card, it's not going to print out for you. Uh, it is going to take the order and it'll mail it out to you, typically arriving in about uh, seven business days. If I have a patron who's elderly some of that stuff that they probably can't get their benefits cluttered out with, right? It, it's probably, if they can't remember uh, the information to set up the account, you're right. It is, it is going to be difficult in that situation. In that situation, they could either call the 800 number, and our 800 number, uh, we're open from 7 in the morning till 7 at night, nationwide. Uh, I actually recommend that you call earlier in the morning or later in the day. If you're trying to call between 10 and 2 o'clock, so is the rest of the country. Uh, and it's difficult to get in, you might have a 45 minute to an hour and 15 minute wait. Uh, so you've got to be very careful. If you're calling like it's 7 in the morning, 6.30 at night, it's going to be easier to get through. That's what I usually recommend to people. Uh, or you could go into a social security office and they can print out the letter for you right there. Yeah, I think of one particular patient who was trying to get, he had to get benefits and he needed that letter. And he didn't know the answer to his question. Yeah, like I said, I mean, they, they, they are asking some questions. We, we really want to be sure that whoever's, because after you get access to this account, you can redirect a person's check. Like I said, you can change your address, change your phone number, change your direct deposit. And unfortunately, we have had that happen. And, and even more unfortunate, it's typically not done by a stranger or somebody stealing your identity. It's done by a family member, where they've redirected your check into their bank account and then taken your money. Question in the back. Very good point. We, uh, Social Security does have a program called Spouses Benefits, uh, which basically guarantees that your Social Security payment will be no smaller than the equivalent of 50% of what your spouse is going to get. That's all this program does. So we do have some people that have uh, not worked very much, and they're, they're going to get some benefits off their spouse's record. So and this could be an ex-spouse as well. If you were married to somebody for 10 years and you divorced them, you are potentially eligible for benefits on your ex-husband or ex-wife's record as well. Uh, and we don't care how many times you've been married. If you've been married four different times to, some, to different people, 10 years apiece, 
We'll let you look at all four records and get the highest of your ex-spouses. So it's good to have many spouses. That's the moral of the story. Uh, with this, once again, you can only open up the account for yourself. So if you had somebody that said, hey, my, I know my record's very low. I, I'm only going to get maybe $500 off my own Social Security record. But I know my, my husband and my wife, uh, their record's probably $2,000. So I know I can get some money off of their record, but I, I want to get a better idea of what I'm going to get. In that situation, you're actually going to need to go into an office. Not only are you going to need to go into the office, you're going to need to go in with your original marriage certificate and original divorce certificate to establish that you have the right to get this information. Even then, they're not going to give you the exact dollar amount for privacy purposes. <coughs> they might say something like this, you're going to get $400 off of your own record, and it looks like you're going to get an additional about $500 off of your spouse's record. So they'll, they'll, uh, in no situations, because they need to see those original documents, they can be certified copies as well, they're going to actually, you're going to need to go into an office in that situation. Question? Because I, I had tried, just as a widow, to, to find out about the husbands, and they were like, no, and he obviously couldn't fill it out, you know, and they still wouldn't do it. They still, like, had to go in with a death certificate and marriage certificate. So uh, you are correct, we also pay survivor's benefits, so if you have a spouse that has passed away, you potentially can receive benefits off your deceased spouse's record. Now often with a deceased spouse, it's a little bit easier, because typically with a deceased spouse, most people file for what we call the lump sum death payment, meaning that when someone passes away, uh, and if you're not eligible to get monthly benefits, you can actually file for the one-time payment of $255. Uh, which in 1952 could actually bury you. Uh, we haven't changed the dollar amount since 1952, but you can still apply for your $255. Uh, after that, and one of the reasons that we still keep that around, is that would identify you as the surviving spouse. You could say, hey, I've already filed for benefits. My, my information is on his record. They could use his social security number, pull up his record, your name, and the fact that you claim the 255 would be on there. They would then have to identify you to make sure you're the same person uh, that collected that, but then they could actually give you the information uh, over the phone. The interesting thing about survivor's benefits is the dead generally have no privacy rights. So we don't need to see most certificates in that situation uh, because we're not protecting the privacy of a, of a living person. So in those situations, you, you normally should be able to get that over the phone. Uh, if they, but, they, but if for some reason you weren't on there, you didn't apply for the 255, and not everybody knows that, that you can do that, uh, then yes, you, they would say, well, we're going to need to see some proof. We need to see the death certificate, the marriage certificate, to make sure that you're eligible to get benefits off that record. Question? I work here at the library, and so we have United Way is here, assisting people with their taxes, and they need the physical Social Security card. And so a lot of times people forget to bring the Social Security card and we tell them to go to the socialsecurity.gov website. So what's the process they need to do and are they getting um, a confirmation when they ask to get a replacement card? So they, you're saying that they need the original card for what? They need a physical Social Security card to apply to get assistance to fill out their income tax. Okay, that, and that's a separate requirement the Social Security, that's not what the Social Security card is, was meant to be used for. That's a separate requirement that's being put on um, them by the individuals that are providing support for that. I think it became law well, like two years ago that the federal government required individuals to bring in their Social Security To bring in their card. Social Security card? The IRS has to, it requires that you show proof. That you show proof of your Social Security, and that's, yes. that's just the easiest way that they're doing it, yeah. so show right. us the Social Security card. So there's probably other alternative information that they can bring in. That having been said, if you have one of these accounts, what you do is you get, you, basically it would print up a statement saying, <laughs> you have requested your Social Security card. Whether that's good enough, I don't know. Yes, um, I think this is, uh, I mean, that's sufficient, but I want to know what's on there. Is it a confirmation <coughs> number on that document? It would actually just normally be a printout saying, you've requested uh, okay. a, a Social Security card. Okay. Now, on that statement, it's probably not going to have the Social Security number. What would actually be easier, rather than doing that, is just print up your Social Security statement, uh, which would basically be, here's your Social Security number, but here's your entire work history. 
uh, here's how much you're going to get for benefits. It's going to have a lot more verification, a lot, actually a lot more identification value than getting a social security card, which just has a name and social security number on it. Your statement shows your name, date of birth, social security number. That actually should trump having the uh, social, uh, a social security card in that respect. Uh, I would also check with those groups, like I said, that uh, they're probably requiring some sort of proof to identify who you are to make sure that you're that person. And that's probably the easiest thing they just came up with, show us a social security card. There's probably alternatives to what other ideas that they could provide. Uh, to show the proof there. So you might want to explore that too. No, they actually, you mean identification is one, but the Social Security, I think just two years ago, is required. Really? Mm -hmm. the, benefit, the benefit letter sometimes will suffice if it's a United Way Tax Clinic. Mm -hmm. So you should check with the United Way and just see if the benefit letter. Well, we work with them. So do On they the same say, floor. Right. Yeah, they say they, you have to go to the Social Security. Huh. website and I just want to know what the process was and what it looked like. Yeah, so actually, oops, oh there we go. Uh, so actually with that, uh, you would just open up your My Social Security account, you okay. could get the card. It's easier than going into the office, but if you need it that day, it's still going to be a process to get the card. Whether you go into the office or you have this account and you go online, you're still not going to have it that day. I think they just need proof that you applied or requested it. Okay. <laughs> So you just go to My Social Security. Yep, and then you can print up it. And basically, it's a little one-line se sentence on the page. You, you might even have to screen print it that basically says, you have ordered your Social Security card. Should be out to you in 7 to 10 business days. Okay. If people have multiple Social Security numbers, uh, do they have to go into an office to resolve that? If a person has a mul multiple Social Security numbers, and this was a lot more common uh, for people, you know, back in the 60s and 50s, you know, oh, I forgot my number. You could just go in and we actually ask for very little proof. And so we, we do have people that ended up with multiple social security numbers. Uh, just like it used to be easy to get a passport. You wanted to go in to get a passport, you'd just go into a post office and they'd print you up a passport right there uh, in the 60s. Uh, with that situation, if you have multiple social security numbers, if you, the, the problem becomes is do you have work on both numbers? If you have work on both numbers, then it becomes a little more difficult. You have to go in and we have to merge the two records and basically meld them together so we can transfer the work from uh, one record back to the other record, the, the, norm, the one that you normally used. So yeah, you're going you're gonna to need to go in, and that is if you review your work history and you say, hey, I know I, I worked in the 70s and I don't see any work in 75 through 77, uh, but maybe I, you know, maybe I got a different card, whatever it might be, then yeah, you're going to need to go in and we're going to need to put those two records together. Do you get benefits from your spouse or your former spouse, even if you were the higher wage earner? Potentially, yes, uh, for survivor's benefits. So I'll give you an example. Uh, I'll give you an interesting example. Let's say you're married to somebody for 10 years and you divorce them. And uh, uh, then you, let's say you get married a second time and you're married for seven years and you divorce that person. Then you arrive at age 60 or after. Here's the interesting part for survivor's benefits. At 60 or after, we actually even allow you to get remarried and still claim benefits on your prior spouse's record. So uh, I always have to use the example, you're getting remarried at age 60. At age 60, as you're getting remarried, you hear that your first spouse has passed away. We can ignore your current marriage because you're getting married at 60 or after. We can ignore the second marriage because you've divorced that person. And now we allow you to skip all the way back to marriage number one and at age 60, you could get 71.5% of the deceased individual's benefits. Then at your full retirement age, let's say age 66 or age 67, you could drop their benefits and then get 100% of your benefits for the rest of your life. Or even better, if you wait past your full retirement age, you wait till age 70, we give you bonus credits. So you could draw the survivor's benefits for 10 years, <coughs> drop their record at age 70, and then get 125% of your benefits for the rest of your life. So there's a number of different ways you can uh, do that to maximize your benefits. Or you can go the other direction. Maybe at age 62, you file for your own benefits. You, your benefits are reduced. You only get about 75% of your benefit at age 62. And then at your full retirement age, you drop your benefits and get 100% of the benefits of the deceased individual. So there's a number of different ways that you can do that. Now then, the typical situation we see is that 
you know, people that live together, they're married, they, they grow old together, one of them passes away. In that situation, you can only get the higher of the two benefits. You do not get both benefits. So let's say you're married to someone, you're getting $2,000 a month, your spouse is getting $2,200 a month. Your spouse passes away. Well, what's gonna happen is you're not gonna get both the 2,200 and your 2,000. You're simply gonna convert up to the 2,200. Now then, you pass away, your spouse is getting the 2,200, you are getting the 2,000. There's nothing for your spouse to convert to. They simply stay at the $2,200 per month. And you all know that when one couple, when one person in a couple passes away, the bills in that household are cut in half, right? <laughs> now, that's one of the unfortunate things that with, with survivor's benefits that you'll often find that person that's left behind, uh, without that income coming in, it can be very difficult to continue their particular lifestyle. Now, a couple other things I just want to point out on our website here. Great section over here on the far right side. Frequently asked questions. If you have someone come in and just says, I, I want to know what the Social Security thing is all about. What, how does it work? What, how do I get benefits? You know, how do I find, can I get survivor's benefits? Can I get spouse's benefits? Great section here. If you go to the section there, it actually breaks it down by topic, retirement, spouse's benefits, survivor's benefits, Medicare coverage, uh, and then further breaks it down there. You can either look at all the 30, to, uh, we basically try to put in the top 80% of questions that we get. So there's, of course, probably, if for all of them, there's probably about 100 to 150 questions in there. So you can break it down to a number of different ways. You can look at all the questions. You can just look at groups of questions. If you want to give yourself a self-tutorial, you can just read down all the questions to help you understand the benefits. And they're nice, easy, one-line questions, about a paragraph, paragraph and a half of information to give you a basic knowledge of the programs. So great place to start. Uh, also like to point out, oh, Uh, no, let's go backwards. Yeah, uh, up here in the uh, top uh, corner where it says languages, right here. Most of the publications we have, and we have about 136 different publications, uh, you can order those publications online, you can download them as a PDF, but you can also download them or print them in 15 different languages. So we have a number of different languages that people can uh, access. Uh, we have Russian, Somali. Uh, if you want to learn about Social Security in Greek, you can learn about it in Greek. Uh, so a very good resource here if you want to understand benefits. You can also download audio files of our publications as well. So if you want to listen to Social Security, you're having trouble sleeping at night and you want to listen to Social Security, uh, I encourage you to do that. It will put you to sleep pretty quick. Uh, but great place, great resource, once again, to get publications on all of our different programs uh, in English uh, and all of our publications are also in Spanish. We actually have a mirror site also that's in Spanish. Uh, so it's all in the Spanish language, just not the publications. Uh, and so you can go on there and get information uh, about Social Security. Any other general questions about Social Security? Yes. So on this uh, pamphlet on page 21, it says that the uh, social security taxes you don't pay social security taxes on earnings greater on earnings greater than 118,500 yes could you explain that yes uh, social security has a ceiling meaning that when you're working and paying into the program and actually I think that's the old amount the current amount is actually uh, 127,000 uh, currently basically when you're working at a job someplace uh, after you make $127,000, they stop taking the 6.2% out of your paycheck. Your employer stops paying in the additional 6.2% as well. So basically, if you went out and made a million dollars, for our purposes, on our statement, it's going to look like you made $127,000. So we do have these maximums, which also creates the fact that there is a maximum Social Security payment that you can receive as well. Uh, so yes, we do have that ceiling level uh, on, on the benefits. Currently uh, about 127000 Now that, that is different from paying income taxes on your Social Security benefits. You may get that question as well. Uh, you do, Social Security payments are potentially taxable just like other pensions that you might receive. Uh, right now, if you have a combined income of under $25,000 as an individual, or under $32,000 as a couple filing jointly, 
you don't pay any income taxes on your Social Security checks. Above those limits, you do pay in income taxes on your Social Security checks as they come into you. We uh, about 40% of all people receiving Social Security payments pay some form of income taxes on their Social Security monies. Good news though, uh, normally when you pay income taxes, the money goes to the IRS. When you pay income taxes on your Social Security monies, the money actually flows back to Social Security. So it's, uh, I can see that makes you all much happier about paying taxes. <laughs> uh, but it is a good thing. Uh, we actually get about $3 billion a year to support the program by the taxation of benefits. Uh, and that's a significant amount of money to support Social Security. Any other general questions? I think we have about a few minutes. Any other general questions about anything? Yes, here and then here. Um, I'm going to be married soon, so I'll be taking the name. Congratulations. Thank you. Should I wait to set up my Social Security until after I go through a name change? Or could I set it up now? You could set it up now uh, and then go in and do the name change later on. Um, so if you're changing your name, you can set it up now under your current name. The, the problem would be is that if you then tried to go in later on and you, well actually after you've set it up, there's not going to be any problems because we're only going to use your pen and password from that point forward. So there wouldn't be really an issue. Uh, the problem becomes is that you get married, you change your name, and you don't update your social security record. And then you go in and try to set up the record and you're using your current name and the computer's saying, no, you're not Smith, we show your name as Brown. And so it's going to boot you out directly. Uh, in those situations, you'd need to go in and update the records uh, so we have the correct name. That also becomes an issue start down further down the road as you start to try to do taxes, uh, because when you put in your social security number onto your tax records, if you're trying to do it electronically, it's going to kick, kick you out because you're going to be using a different last name to, compared to what we show on our so, uh, social security records. It will also start to interfere with your driver's licenses because the driver's license uh, uh, also interfaces with Social Security to verify that your information is the same. So, Question here? Yeah, it's maybe an unfair question, but um, when I'm working with clients, oftentimes I'll hear, oh, it doesn't matter, it's not going to be here anyway. And so, you know, and so we try to deal with the here and the now and the reality sure. of it's, it's here now. Mm -hmm. But how would you answer, how would you, um, you know, give comfort to a, a client who might be worrying about that. Well, and I, and I hear that all the time also. You know, people say, oh, you know, I, there isn't going to be, I'm never going to get any Social Security benefits. Uh, and I always ask those people, oh, well, that's, that's, that's always a possibility. So what are you doing to prepare for retirement then? You're putting a lot of extra money aside, I would assume, because you're going to reach retirement one day, uh, and so you must be doing a lot of extra planning. No, I'm not doing any extra planning. Oh, okay. <laughs> Social Security for the average person represents about 40% of their retirement income. That's what the program was originally designed to do. Unfortunately, in this country, one out of every three people will depend on Social Security for 90% of their retirement income. Another one-third will depend on Social Security for close to 50% of their retirement income. So it's a very, very important program. Today, Social Security actually is in pretty good shape. Today, Social Security has about $2.8 trillion saved up in the Social Security Trust Fund. However, as the baby boomers continue to file for benefits, this is going to put a strain on the system. Uh, we actually just, uh, uh, earlier, early last week, the trustees released a report uh, on the health of the Social Security system and its projections over the next 75 years. And the current estimates indicate that Social Security will not be able to pay all of its obligations come the year 2034. At that point, we'll still be bringing in billions, hundreds of billions of dollars, just that we'll be paying out more. At that point, as our estimates 2034, we would only be able to pay 77% of all of our obligations. <coughs> Which means, since we have no authority to borrow at that time, everybody getting benefits and everybody that will get benefits will take a 23% cut. Now then, that's not necessarily very comforting uh, to people, uh, but it, it is a far cry from many people that say, I'll never see anything from Social Security, why should I care about that? That's simply not the reality of the situation. Our worst case scenario right now is that we'll be able to pay 77% of all of our obligations, uh, which is you know, not good. If you owe someone a dollar and all you have is 77 cents, that's not good. Uh, but it's, like I said, it's a far cry from uh, not being anything. What I encourage people to do is to take that information, understand what the real situation is, 
and encourage their congressman, their senator, their president to come up with a solution to meet that problem. Question? Well, that's what I was going to refer to because, not to get political, but if you take the damn cap off, we could pay Social Security quite well for a long time. That is one of the solutions. Uh, the, the comment was is that if you lifted the cap, no matter how much money you make, you pay into Social Security, and that is one of the solutions that's been uh, floated, that in and of itself does not solve the problem. Uh, it does bring in a lot of extra money, uh, but it does not solve the problem in and of itself. Uh, it gets us a good chunk of the way there. They're thinking that would solve about 40% of the deficit, but it would not eliminate the problem. You still have to have other adjustments to the program that would need to be made. And if you want to learn more about this, at our website, we actually have a section called Congressional. You can go there and you can see all the different proposals that various congressmen and senators have come up with to uh, extend the life of the Social Security system. Uh, there's and all the different current and past legislation that's been passed or proposed to uh, work with Social Security. Any other final questions? I think we got about our, any other comments? A AARP also has um, extensive resource on mm -hmm. Social Security along with 10 plans um, that offer solutions for how to fix Social Security. Um, and it would be great just to get read up on some of those issues. It's, um, it's very enlightening um, and it really helps you answer some of those questions to understand um, the challenges ahead. One other thing, I sat in on the panel that was talking about fraud and scams. Um, AARP runs the Fraud Watch Network um, for the country out of our Washington State office here. And we also have a great team of volunteers that go out and speak and give fraud presentations um, across the state. And um, what's great about that is they're older people, and older people prefer to talk to other older people. Um, it's just a fact. And especially when it's a sensitive information, they don't want to be looked down upon for making a bad choice or a bad decision when it came to you know, a potential scam or fraud. They're also available on the phone. Um, numerous times I have met somebody at an event um, and they have you know, kind of secretly told me what's happened. And instead of me trying to resolve or problem shoot, um, one of our volunteers will actually call them and talk to them. And we oftentimes can help um, get some resolution around that. I put some fraud watch um, information on the back um, table, including the phone number and the contact information. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that Washington State was one of 13 states that did not have a crime for the financial exploitation of vulnerable adults. So the stories that you heard about people losing you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of retirement savings, we, AARP worked with the Attorney General and the King County Prosecutor's Office. And so we now have a new law in the state that increase it pretty significantly increases the penalties for um, financial exploitation before it used to be a mild jail sentence um, now there is significant prison time and restitution um, and so we're hoping on kind of the punitive side to be looking at this and then also on the awareness side any other questions for any of us today a question yes so for those of us who are going to retire after the 2034 if we looked at my sorry sure. if we looked at um the my social security now would that factor in that 23 percent drop so if you're planning if you looked at your statement right now mm -hmm. you printed up the statement it would not factor that in mm -hmm. although in that statement there is a paragraph in there that says based on current uh estimates social security and, it, and just what i explained come the year 2034 social security might have to cut benefits so while it's not factored into those numbers, we are acknowledging it uh, in the statement and we are encouraging people to pay attention to this because uh, it is something vital to all of us. Uh, and even if I, I've talked to people that says, well, I'm not gonna be here in 2034. <laughs> well, maybe that's true, but your kids or your grandchildren will be. And they're going, this is gonna be a program that they're going to count on. So you do need to be involved and, and make decisions on this. Last thing I wanna say is I'm actually the Washington State uh, public affairs representative and uh, actually if you have groups that want to have a presentation about Social Security I can't get out to all locations but we can certainly do them by phone for many I end up doing it by phone because uh, I cover the entire state but have no travel budget uh, <laughs> uh, 
So, so a lot of my presentations I end up by doing by phone. If you do have some groups that are interested in that, they can actually go to our website and under the search function just put uh, request a speaker and they can actually requ request that someone come out and do a presentation for them about social security programs and we're happy to talk about all aspects of the program. Thank you very much.